So I want to talk about various sort of amplifier circuits, and particularly voltage controlled, voltage source driven circuits that have capacitors as kind of the core con sort of the core sort of structure around it, even though you know, maybe there'll be other elements, kind of thinking about these as capacitive circuits. And so the, the conversation might be around this particular amplifier circuit, which has two capacitors, um, two capacitors and a voltage controlled voltage source. And you might look at this circuit and think, huh, this feels a lot like if I did an op-amp circuit with a finite amount of gain. And we're going to talk about both of these circuits as having a gain of, let's say, 100,000. C1 over C2 is going to be a right, you know, like a 100 or less. And you start thinking through these circuits and figure out what, what these implications are. And you could also talk about a case, what happens if I have a resistor sitting between that middle node and the output? And this is often used with capacitive circuits to kind of set a DC point or a low frequency cutoff sort of uh, space, one, to be able to set a charge question that's going to be sitting right here. There's some charge at this node and it doesn't get set and you can kind of set that as either a good thing or a problem and kind of depends on your perspective on it. Either way both these circuits solve out and you can kind of see various possibilities in terms of the overall solution of these circuits. So this might be your preferred way of looking at it but the core concept actually sits in a circuit of this form. And in both cases, I can simply write, you know, KCL at this node, and it actually helps me to form what's going on. In this case, they're being written Laplace. Here you can kind of see just the two capacitors in this node. Here you can see the two capacitors plus the actual added element for the resistance. In both cases, I do need to keep this keep in mind that also the output voltage is minus A sub B times V1 which is basically due to the fact that I have this voltage controlled voltage source. Again, this exact same sort of thing I would imagine seeing if in fact I was doing an op-amp circuit um, in either case. Both of them give you that kind of equivalence when you're looking at it. Well, if I'm doing this in the ideal case without the resistance in the loop, I can imagine, okay, I'm going to get V in, I'm going to get a whole bunch of other term, I'm going to get a C2, plus an additional term in here due to the gain. I could then eventually just even write out what the entire transfer function is in terms of S, and I'm going to get S over S in these terms. Um, the C plus the term is going to be C1 plus C2 over A sub V. I can, and all of this is an S. Now, if S is not equal to zero, of course, I can divide through by S. If S is equal to zero, this is not appropriate, but S equal to zero is DC. That's going to basically be a constant term, and, and remember that for these kind of capacitive circuits, I'm going to have a constant uh, offset that's going to be related to the stored charge at that node. Not the primary focus here. Focus here is to notice that I've got C2 plus a term over the gain. So I could look at what is kind of the percentage shift of this, say C1 over C2, is going to tell, related to A sub V, is going to tell me how good is this approximation going to be. So if I have something where the gain is 100,000 and the ratio is like 100, well, this error is going to be, you know, maybe 1% or, or less in that situation. And so the sort of ideal solution of C2 over C1 is actually probably a pretty good, pretty good approach depending on what it is and what constraints for the circuit you're building. You can see this even further if I'm talking about it in terms of a resistive structure added into it. What I notice is when I put this whole structure together, V1, of course, still has this gain term. So I can still relate V1 and, and V out. As a result of that, I have still the Vn term here. All the V1 terms get modified into V out terms. And the V out terms, of course, continue, and I get all of these additional terms. These two terms here would have been there had A sub B been basically going to in infinity. In other words, had the amplifier been infin had an infinite gain for an op amp, or an ideal case. These are the terms you get for the non-ideal case. And you go, hmm, I wonder what that's going to do. Well, I can kind of group things again. I get a C2, and then I get a C1 plus C2 over A sub V, and I also get, for the 1 over R term, a 1 plus 1 over A sub V. Well, A sub V is like 10,000, so this is very small. In effect, you know, even if A sub V was 100, this wouldn't mean very much. Here, C1 plus C2 related to... C1 compared to the C2, remember it's about 100, but it's over that 10,000. 
So I can really find that this term here really is fairly small compared to C2. But it's kind of important to see those ratios depending on the parameters that I'm dealing with. Because if I continue this out, then I'm just going to have V out over Vn is going to be a simple high pass first order filter. C1 over C1R and SC2R, um, this would be the magnitude. There's actually a negative sign on this particular gain term. And what you would end up finding is that for high frequencies or higher frequencies, the gain will simply just be in magnitude of C1 over C2. And so this is kind of what you would expect for this kind of structure. But the thinking is, is, is to try to think about the capacitors as kind of the core elements. And sometimes the, that's kind of what sets the kind of zeroth order behavior of the circuit. And sometimes it's the resistors that actually set the dynamics of the circuit. So it all kind of depends on the way that you're approaching a particular implementation. And that perspective gives you different, different useful insights in either approach.